Welcome everyone to the first uh, speaker seminar series for uh, January of 2022. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I will note that we have um, the format for this, sem this uh, semester lined up already. And just to let you know, in February, we have Dr. Elemento, who's the director of the Institute for Precision Medicine at Weill Cornell. In March, we're gonna have Dr. Geshwind, who is leads the Precision Medicine Program at UCLA Health. And then in uh, April, we will have uh, Sir Professor Mike Caulfield, um, who just uh, stepped down after running Genomics England and is uh, leading the introduction of um, genomics into healthcare. So today for the first speaker, we will have uh, one of our own. This is great to introduce uh, Phil Empey. Phil is an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacy and Therapeutics. Uh, he received his PharmD from the University of Rhode Island and completed his residency uh, at the University of Kentucky. He earned a PhD in clinical pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Kentucky, Kentucky and then did his postdoctoral research training at the University of Pittsburgh. As I said, he's uh, currently associate professor. Uh, Dr. MP is also associate director for pharmacogenomics at the Pitt and UPMC Institute for Precision Medicine and leads the Precise RX and the Test to Learn teams to implement pharmacogenomics clinical research and edu educational initiatives, which he'll talk about today. Uh, Dr. Empey also directs the University of Pittsburgh Thermo Fisher Scientific Pharmacogenomics Center of Excellence, which as you'll hear today is deploying population scale preemptive pharmacogenomic testing uh, to individuals in Western Pennsylvania. As a clinician scientist, Dr. MP is interested in understanding the mechanisms of the variability in drug response to improve medication related outcomes in critically ill patients. Dr. MP has received uh, numerous uh, funding and awards, and I'll just Note two awards that he received in 2018. Uh, Dr. Empey received the Chancellor's Distinguished Teacher Award from the University of Pittsburgh. And in 2021, uh, he was elected a fellow of the American College of Clinical Pharmacy. If you have questions at the end of the uh, seminar, you can place them in the chat or you can place them in the chat throughout the seminar. But if you put them in the chat, that would be great. Otherwise, we will be opening it up for questions and you're also welcome to ask them to Dr. MP directly. Phil, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, let me sh share my slides. Can everyone see that? Yep. All righty. Let me just check one thing on my side. Perfect. So thanks, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'd like to talk about really what I think is the premier use case for precision medicine, and that's pharmacogenomics. And what we're doing here at Pitt and UPMC in order to make this a reality for our patients, as well as to spearhead additional research in precision medicine, education, and implementation science. So I'd like to start off with sort of a big why. Um, and I think this helps sort of ground the topic around medication use. And it's, a, it's kind of a scary slide, because if you look at the US total prescription drug spending, this is uh, real data as well as a projection from CMS. And you can see our drug costs in the United States are accelerating uh, rapidly. We're north of $350 billion each year. And you know, frankly, if we don't find better ways of getting uh, good outcomes surrounding medications, this rise is uh, already becoming unsustainable for our payers and for our patients alike. Now added on top of that is at least part of that cost is due to the iteration in trial and error prescribing. So adverse drug reactions are, are still the fourth leading cause of death in the US. And beyond the adverse events, which I think received the lion's share of the uh, spotlight, you know, we had to think about not side effects, but failed efficacy as an adverse event as well. And for number of medications that are commonly prescribed, our efficacy rate is not that great. Uh, it's right around 50% for all medications on the market that get the response you're looking for with the first dose of the medication, the first uh, prescription regimen. And I would argue that if we can do better here about eliminating this trial and error, or at least reducing it, we may be able to bend that curve uh, to use, a, uh, I guess, a, a recent um, verbiage there for to flatten the curve uh, to, in order to get our prescription costs to be lower with better treatment outcomes. 
Now, this is the other driver. I'm sure I'm almost everyone on this call has seen a, a version of this, uh, but this data from NHGRI and the three leading uh, genome center sequencing centers in the country and shows the rapid decline in testing costs. So we did cross $500 the human genome a couple times, but we're hovering just above that now in terms of average costs for the testing itself, not necessarily for the clinical interpretation. But the take home here is that technology uh, is increasingly available at low cost. And even though I have sequencing on here, it also does extend to other areas of genomics. And if we think about arrays being anywhere from 10 to 20 fold lower in cost, we're starting to think of genomics being something that we can literally prescribe uh, to every patient where it makes sense. Now, why do I think pharmacogenomics makes sense um, versus the other areas? Uh, why is a leader in precision medicine? And it's really what you see here in terms of these, these, these bubbles. Uh, pharmacogenomics uh, specifically, we know a lot about the way medications work. We generally can tell whether they're working. Patients may know or we can measure levels pretty simply of a drug uh, in the bloodstream. The genetic variants that we're looking at are not rare. Um, if we were to measure uh, maybe seven, eight genes in the majority of patients on this call, greater than 90% of you will be carrying at least one actionable genotype. It's just whether you get the medication at one point in your lifetime. So uh, as mentioned, uh, gene these are germline polymorphisms we're talking about um, today and in many cases of pharmacogenomics, which means tests once reuse the data. And then when we talk to our patients, it's not that there's no ethical concerns. There certainly always is with genetic testing but they're much less than disease prediction where maybe there isn't a therapy we can rely upon. And this is the final reason, and that's really comes down to how much data we have available to guide us. Now there's obviously a, a big change here with the completion of the Human Genome Project and multiple rounds of funding at NIH uh, to advance the pharmacogenomics research network, but there is now uh, way more data than anyone can keep, keep up with. And many, much of that data is at very high level. So there are 79 drugs that are currently CPIC A, meaning that there are, um, if data were available in the medical record, we should be using it for prescribing. It's the highest level of uh, evidence associations we have. And then if we look one level beyond that into where data is emerging, there are thousands and thousands of annotations that have not quite met the level of clinical actionability yet, but await further study to determine whether they should be used or not. So it creates a wonderful research opportunity if we have the data and sort of drive some of our initiatives here at UPMC. And even the FDA has stepped in very recently with their own guidelines around how to use pharmacogenomic information. And there is quite a bit of information actually currently in medication labels. It's about 350 medications or so that have some mention of pharmacogenomics in their labeling uh, to guide care. So if we have data, we should use it. Testing costs are coming down. And there's a lot of wastage or waste uh, resources in terms of prescribing if we're not thinking about individualizing care. So taken together, we think this makes just a ripe opportunity uh, for exploring pharmacogenomics as a, a driver of precision medicine. So what are we doing here in Pittsburgh and what is our vision in Pittsburgh? Um, as many of you know, we are at an outstanding um, opportunity in a facility to be able to conduct precision medicine. And I would argue this is really the ideal laboratory in order which to do it in. Uh, we are the largest academic nonprofit health system in the country. We have wonderful recruitments uh, through the All of Us program here at the University of Pittsburgh that is bringing in folks who are interested in precision medicine, along with the registry, our front funding, all the seven schools of the health sciences together, and then in partnership with a really leading medical center uh, that has the patients, the hospital systems, as well as the payer and the, the venture commercialization arms that can bring things to market. So this is really you know, a, a great place to, to bring research and clinical implementation and think about the analytics and to prove the value of these data at a large level. So I'm gonna talk about three areas of deployments, uh, the clinical areas, so that's our Precise Rx program and the new primary care precision medicine clinic, which is driving clinical uh, back into research and bringing observations back into the lab the new pharmacogenomic center of excellence, which is taking research observations and bringing it into clinical space. And then our test to learn program, which is driving education to accelerate both uh, the prior initiatives. So back in 2015, we were among the first to do a demonstration project here at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, to determine whether we could personalize uh, testing 
for antiplatelet medications in the cardiac catheterization lab. Now, this was originally grant funded and just as I determined to be a demonstration project to see whether it was feasible. We weren't powered for uh, clinical outcomes to start, but uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, we expanded the project in order to capture those outcomes. So this is the press release from UPMC when we launched. Uh, we gained quite a bit of excitement in the local community around perhaps getting to individualized care uh, even seven years ago. Now, what is this use case based on? Whether you like biology on the left or chemistry on the right, uh, clopidogrel uh, is a prodrug. It needs to be activated, and a small percentage of it actually binds uh, as an active metabolite to its receptor on the platelet to inhibit aggregation. It's a two-step activation, and it's dependent upon a cytochrome P450 metabolizing enzyme called CYP2C19. And you can already start to imagine if you were not to have functional 2C19 or maybe too much 2C19, well, maybe you'd have different levels of active metabolites. And indeed, that's what you can see if you take every, all the way from the genome-wide association study that was uh, published a number of years ago that found a single cluster associated with major adverse cardiac events after using clopidogrel uh, in coronary scenting to the pharmacokinetics that show poor metabolizers have much higher inactivated parent levels. They weren't able to convert or activate the medication to its active metabolites. And then finally, the pharmacodynamic association on the right showing that poor metabolizers have much less inhibition of plate aggregation or its therapeutic effect. So taken together, there seems to be a strong genetic association that's uh, where the biology can be tested by measuring drug levels, as well as measuring the eventual phenotype. So based on these data, it made a lot of sense for us to think about this uh, as a deployment um, and implementation here at UPMC. So our precise RX program, uh, we did spend about 18 months building uh, all the necessary components and the infrastructure here at UPMC. And we designed this as a standard of care deployment. Initially it was a research program, but as new data came out, uh, it made sense that we could deploy it in all patients. And it became something we uh, made as an order set, something that we deployed for every patient who had a um, PCI and an intervention here at Presbyterian Hospital. We brought on new on-site testing in McGee and developed a, a clinically validated test here on site for fast turnaround time. We protocolized ordering and therapy mo modification, developed a new pharmacies-led service, and you can see our current uh, team on the right-hand side led by Dr. Coons, who is uh, our clinical specialist and faculty member in cardiovascular uh, in the School of Pharmacy. We were able to get discrete results from this new lab into Epic and Cerner, and then to build interrupted decision support to aid our clinicians along with the notes from our pharmacists in order to guide care. And this is our algorithm um, that we launched in 2015. And essentially says if you're an intermediate or poor metabolizer, that's the, that's the third and fourth boxes there, then in a newer prescribed clopidogrel, one of our pharmacists uh, would recommend a change pending no other clinical factors that would um, drive uh, a different therapy. If you were normal or higher than normal, an ultra rapid or a rapid metabolizer, you'd be expected to be able to activate clopidogrel and we would allow you to stay in the medication or if you were prescribed an alternative agent, we, maybe we could consider stepping down to the more inexpensive uh, clopidogrel therapy. So this is exactly the guideline that is now in practice uh, elsewhere and uh, ends up being a pretty simple um, algorithm to follow in clinical practice. Here's a screenshot of what our screenshot look, results look like. Uh, this is right after launch, and you can see 2016. Um, you can see that we got the results coming from our lab in the medical record. And this is, again, an early example of a best practice advisory where we're alerting to a prescriber that particular patients are getting ready to prescribe clopidogrel in is an intermediate metabolizer, and that we should recommend a different therapy, in this case, a change to um, Prasigrel to Cagrelor. Um, and if there's any questions, to contact the UPMC pharmacogenomics team. So these alerts fire in every patient uh, with a clopidogrel order that's an IM, intermediate or poor metabolizer, in order to drive changes in therapy. So I'm going to fast forward until just uh, last month, and you can see that we've uh, kept up our pace of, uh, of stenting in the cath lab, even, even through COVID. Uh, with 3,777 patients uh, genotyped to date. You can see the predicted phenotypes um, from the genotype results that came in the medical record. And about 29% of our patients, as expected, 
are carrying a loss of function or a no function variance and would be expected to respond poorly to clopidogrel. So these are our patients that if they're on that medication, we'll make recommendations for changes. And you can see the other percentages for the normal and the rapid L-tarpin metabolizers. Now, when all said and done, about 19% of our patients have actionable genotypes, meaning that they were still on uh, clopidogrel. The difference between those percentages are those that were on alternative therapy for some other reason already. So one in five, one in five patients were making recommendations, pending other clinical factors uh, and making recommendations for a pretty high yield rate within this particular deployment. And then if we uh, follow our reimbursement moving forward, uh, we've only had four instances reported back to us so far uh, where there's been a challenge or a difficult with uh, reimbursement coverage. So for this particular indication uh, for genetic testing, enjoys a nice and good reimbursement even for the last five years. So outcome data. This is outcome data that was pooled when we contributed to the implementation, implementing genomics and practice network and NHGRI, a network of genomic implementers. Uh, so seven institutions put their data together and we measured major adverse cardiac events. So MI, uh, death or stroke, heart outcomes, uh, after receiving our cardiac stents. Uh, and we can see the lines here in the, in the uh, Kaplan-Meier. So the red line is if a patient was carrying a lot loss of function variant, but for some um, reason stayed on clopidogrel. The blue line is when there was a swap in therapy. And the gray line is the, a patient is not carrying a loss of function variant. So you can see the hazard ratio down at the bottom, uh, statistically significant adjusted uh, risk ratio of um, having an increased risk of major adverse cardiac events if you were not changed the alternative therapy and no difference between the gray and the blue lines. So in layman's term, we were able to reduce the risk of a variant carrier to that of the non-carrying patient population through individualized uh, prescribing, which is exactly the, the, the goal of precision medicine. Um, it's one of the, in terms of these, this analysis um, altogether, we do have to keep in mind this was not a required change. This was elective by the prescriber. And we can use these data to come back in, a, in this pragmatic clinical trial to be able to say that this is something that should become standard of care and to advance our guidelines elsewhere across the system. So that was the goal of this, um, of this overall project with members of the Ignite Consortia. And we also took this data internally to be able to validate our own economic models to see whether we were saving costs of a cost of care in these patients and look at outcomes, as well as other highly relevant questions related to this particular mechanism of action, look at specific alleles, look at reusability of that data, look at economic outcomes, and to see what other value um, this may have had from, from uh, uh, doing this in practice here. We also published the strategies, the how you do this, the implementation science, the you know, what was the rate limiting step? What were the intrinsic and extrinsic factors that limited and made this uh, deployment successful? And reported that uh, back in 2017. I mentioned add on data. One of the questions was whether patients that are carrying um, variants that have a higher expression, therefore may convert more clopidogrel to active metabolite, may have a higher risk of bleeding. And in a similar analysis, it's just over 3,000 patients uh, pooling results again with the Ignite network. We found that was not the case. There was no impact of having a star 17 um, variant of this increased expression variant on clinically significant bleeding events, uh, nor in MACE events. So it sort of validated the, what was in the literature already that there wasn't a strong reason to try to change patients that may be expected to have an increased conversion to an alternative medication because of a higher risk of bleeding. That higher risk of bleeding simply does not manifest itself in larger cohorts. On the right-hand side is a publication, again, with the Ignite Network, where we pooled data looking at the reusability of 2C19 results. That particular enzyme is not only involved in clopidogrel metabolism, but many other drugs in the market as well, and many drugs that are commonly prescribed. So we asked a simple question, if we put this result in the medical record and follow patients forward within the next six months or a year, how often would we be able to, how quickly would we be able to reuse that patient and how often in what percentage of patients? So across all these institutions, and there were eight institutions, about 9,000 patients or so, about half the patients 
uh, within the evaluation period, this six months, uh, was able to find a secondary reuse of this data, uh, meaning that the data may have add-on value beyond the value for the initial use case. Similarly, to complicate things, uh, we looked at drug interactions um, in situations where there might have been a specific reaction with the phenotype the patient was observed, and you would expect it to be fewer than the 51%, not everyone will have an actionable genotype with the other drugs, but still a higher percentage of them did, meaning that if we were to, to save this data from this deployment and be able to reuse it for other drugs, we may get an add-on value. Now, looking at costs, this was a, a, a big question about whether it made sense to um, use a genotype guide escalation therapy uh, trial where we would change patients' alternative therapy uh, based on this IM or PM uh, predicted phenotype. So we pooled all the data across this Ignite group in using the real world outcome data I showed you in that slide a few slides back on our outcome data. We use the real world percentages of our outcomes along with the cost of therapies, the cost of genotyping, and we're able to project whether um, a clopidogrel only strategy or a ticagrelor, or this alternative therapy strategy, or genotype, you know, using genotype to change between two of them was most effective. Um, the two therapies or two strategies that were, were both more effective than using clopidogrel in all patients, that is a genotype guided escalation therapy, as well as a ticagrelor in everyone therapy, but only the genotype guided escalation therapy was determined to have a, a probability of being cross effective at that uh, quality you see there, the quality adjusted life year percentages, I mean cost. Uh, it was much higher in the other group as evidenced by um, the probabilities here. You can see the green line at the bottom. The probability um, is not high for uh, it being cost effective for universal tachegralor, whereas it gets very high very quickly uh, at very low willingness to pay thresholds uh, for gene type guided escalation. So we're now um, advancing this and continuing to use it in practice as shown because we're still doing it here at Standard of Care. And increasingly our collaborators and colleagues across uh, other institutions are employing this as well. Uh, we, we're also concerning whether it makes sense to go the opposite direction, a patient that's given ticagrelor uh, because of other clinical factors, perhaps a, a more complicated surgery or other risk factors could be stepped down. Could they come back down to clopidogrel if we had genetic uh, data suggesting that it may be effective for them? So that happens particularly where we are concerned about bleeding or costs, and we're exploring whether that de-escalation therapy in the network as well as here at Pitt may be of value to our patients. So we'll switch gears a bit because uh, for, for the first five years at UPMC, the only way you could get genetic testing unfortunately, was via that demonstration project. So although there was rising evidence for many genes I showed in the earlier slides, really it was 2C19 that was deployed, and our, we had to turn our patients away that were looking for broader uh, genetic testing. There simply wasn't a, pace, a place or testing to bring patients in to meet uh, specialist clinicians and pharmacists to be able to provide this care. So a couple of years ago, we imagined um, a, a place to be able to do this where we could bring in direct clinical services uh, you can see the team here on the right, that's um, Melinda Massard and Family Medicine, myself and Luke Berenbra coming together to think about how to employ pharmacogenomics specifically in this brand new primary care precision medicine clinic that Dr. Massard leads. And the driving force for the reasons you see here, patients were seeking direct services, needing a place to get that and accessing genetic experts. And this is becoming more and more of need and we were finding strains across the system and other specialist practices for providing this care. So for pharmacogenomics, it was a partnership uh, between the School of Pharmacy and Family Medicine, and Family Medicine taking a leadership role in looking at broader primary care services. So this is a really cool model um, that's proving to be of value to our patients, uh, physician, pharmacists, and genetic counselors together seeing patients for the genetic-based care. And sometimes patients come in with a genetic question for disease, end up talking to us about medications, and vice versa. Sometimes there's a pharmacogenomic interest and we end up understanding and, and discovering other risks that we need to talk about with these patients. And then the referrals can go out to other specialist providers if necessary, or they could follow up within this particular clinic. So the spectrum of services uh, involves uh, the boxes you see here, everything from disease-based assessment to testing and interpretation, management plans, uh, evaluating challenging cases from other providers or from patients themselves, 
and then of course, direct primary care services. And for pharmacogenomics, I'm gonna focus on these three in the middle here, because test interpretation, understanding whether test is necessary and going through challenging drug responses seem to be the drivers so far. And what we're learning is it's not just genetics. So oftentimes patients come in and the care we're providing, uh, led by Dr. Berenbrock, is, is beyond just looking at the genetic test results. And sometimes we're turning people away from testing and saying, it doesn't make sense to test for you in this particular situation. But when we do, we're able to direct testing appropriately, as well as to provide the appropriate follow-up and referrals back to the other providers. So we're really excited about this. I think this is a novel area of practice and something we'll see a lot more of as patients um, engage and use more genetic services. So we talked a little about the clinical, it's just a simple single use case at Pitting UPMC for clopidogrel, an emerging area of practice in clinics. Uh, we're one of a few in the country that are providing direct uh, clinic services for pharmacogenomics. But I wanted to emphasize pharmacogenomics in general is not just individual research-based institutions. And pharmacogenomics is really hitting an inflection point. I've put us on the map with the big stars here in Pittsburgh, but we're not the only ones. Um, whether you've trained elsewhere or have colleagues elsewhere, these are all the active implementation projects that are involved in the research networks we're a part of with NIH or that we've collaborated with in terms of clinical. I am sure I've missed several because um, there's a lot of dots on this thing. So apologies if, if you know of others or if you're watching this saying, hey, where's my dot? Um, the point here is that pharmacogenomics implementation is hitting a significant inflection point and increasingly large initiatives like the one we'll talk about here at Pitting UPMC are being launched. I wanna mention two of them, one that we're a part of here at the University of Pittsburgh with CTSI and the All of Us program, and that's recruiting here in Pennsylvania for that initiative. Pharmacogenomics is a big part of that. And then uh, after we launched our large initiative, I'll talk, talk about it in a minute here, uh, the VA also launched a massive initiative to test up to 250,000 veterans for pharmacogenomics across their 140 sites across the US. So this is becoming commonplace. Increasingly, folks are seeing potential value in doing this. Um, and from a research as well as a clinical implementation, there's a lot of enthusiasm around pharmacogenomics. A little more in, in about the All of Us program, because I think it's significant because it is returning results directly to patients. And we've also started asking our patients about why they might be interested in joining all of us and what data they were most excited about. So these were community studios, studios that were conducted uh, with early cohorts in the All of Us program. And interestingly, among all the different uses of genomic data, the I want to know about my medications or pharmacogenomics was ranked most valuable by participants. So not only is it a potential science or value-based win, but it also seems to be a potential engagement win of folks being interested in getting these data about themselves and to understand their medication experiences. So I play a leadership role in helping all of us design their strategy around pharmacogenomics. And we have recently attained an IDE with the FDA to return results. And in the coming year, folks that are involved in that particular study will receive pharmacogenomic results directly to them. And then the hope is that they'll share those with their providers. So there's a, an early version of our report on the right-hand side, and we will report drug associations, which is novel in, in research-based analyses that are direct to patient returns. So we're really excited about that, and we it made us think about what may perhaps be the best model moving forward um, as we expand our own programs here at Pitt and UPMC. So beyond the research and the big programs here, I also wanna put a plug in for reimbursement. Obviously reimbursement and payer coverage is a major factor in trying to, to think through what we can provide for our patients and where it makes sense with this clinical utility for doing this. And excitingly, last year, uh, there was a significant change for pharmacogenomics. The green states here are involved in the MOLDEX program among Medicare um, jurisdictions for uh, managing that particular program. And there was an, a local coverage determination that was released um, at that time, it was the fall of last year, so actually fall of 2019, and uh, it essentially broadened coverage for the majority of pharmacogenomic targets and all those guidelines that have already been released by CPIC along with the FDA. So there was a the huge change here. I think it, granted it's only, it's Medicare to start, but we had some signals among commercial payers of starting to have some shifts in payer coverage as well, particularly with United Health Plan uh, uh, reimbursing for 
uh, psychiatric and uh, medication therapies for some of the genes as well. So we think the tide is starting to shift here. And certainly for our Medica Medicare beneficiaries, broad testing is now covered. Now you'll notice um, that Pennsylvania is in the gray. So we were not that excited about that part of it because Medicare is a patchwork involved with jurisdiction. But I'm also pleased to report that we joined several other uh, organizations or institutions that are also in the gray states. Um, and we submitted a formal request to our um, Medicare administrative contractor here for Pennsylvania for Novitas Solutions to request an LCD or a local coverage determination for coverage for our state and our jurisdiction. So that was last year. Um, on behalf of the institution and the other institutions as you listed here, we're really excited that they advanced coverage policy. So this went live on December 12th and it mirrors coverage for the other Moldex regions. So moving forward, um, as, of, as of now in Pennsylvania, for Medicare beneficiaries, uh, there is coverage for pharmacogenomics-based testing. We always have to spin up testing uh, solutions to be able to uh, leverage this opportunity, as well as to make sure we're doing all the billing and the coding appropriately and the indications are appropriate. But we're really excited around uh, the opportunity that this has crossed the finish line, at least again for Medicare patients. So I urge you to look at this um, publication we're up last year that explains it. And within it, it does detail which drug gene pairs. So I won't go through all those today, but here is a list. Um, so if you commonly prescribe any of these medications and uh, you were seeking pharmacogenomic testing, um, the coverage policy does include these gene drug pairs. So it's about 75 gene drug pairs, which is a paradigm shift from where we were five years ago when we started. Also covers panel-based testing, which is innovative. Most of the time that's not covered, providing uh, there is an, a reason for testing uh, the multiple genes that we're talking about. You can't just order a panel for a single gene test. But for many of these drugs on the list, there are multi-gene associations. So as long as your panel covers both of those genes, just about how you submit the coding appropriately to get reimbursement. The other thing is it's not indication-based. This is not must be used in the cardiac catheterization lab following PCI. This is just uh, indication for the drug and the testing linked. So if there is a justifiable reason for prescribing the medication, and it is have a guideline associated with, with, with uh, CPIC uh, or the FDA, um, then uh, the coverage policy does kick in. So this is not across all states, but it does include 40 states so far, including Pennsylvania, and again, Medicare patients. So we're looking forward to additional conversations with payers about um, managing this new LCD and to making sure we leverage the opportunity we have for testing here at UPMC. So that end, we were trying to think about, you know, the clopidogrel deployment was very successful locally. We got a lot of research-based knowledge out of that and learned how to deploy broadly here at, at, at UPMC. But it took us 18 months to deploy for that first use case. We started thinking about, well, can we do this more efficiently? Is there a more strategic way to sort of leapfrog um, these other single gene deployments to think about how do we manage a population? How do we drive the best value out of this? Um, seeing that some of these reimbursement things were coming down the horizon and now um, have come for to fruition. So we, as well as others in the United Network, decided to look at our prescribing across the entire health system for drugs where there is level A guidance to determine whether we had high prevalence and in which patients, where they were being seen, what clinics, to start understanding where there might be some value. So we have dual publications here that were in adults as well as pediatrics. We did the same analysis over at Children's to look at what the prevalence was of exposure per 1,000 patients. So this is not just UPMC data, this is in the entire 11 health systems, but this represents millions and millions of patients um, and general prescription trends. So I chopped it uh, because uh, all the patient, all the institutions had data through 2016. We have our data locally uh, from partnership with UPMC Analytics uh, to be able to look at these same things and to guide our future deployments. But the key part of this is there's a lot of um, prescribing in our health system where if we had genetic data, we would have alerts and we'd have guidance. The question is only as to whether we can do it efficiently, whether it's cost effective and whether it makes sense for us to drive these changes in therapy. So from that, we started again, th started thinking about how can we be uh, innovative? How can we think about how to deploy a more panel-based testing approach? How can we get to the endpoints 
where we have genetic data available on all patients to be able to guide prescribing, much like we have allergies. And we envisioned a large population uh, study that was driven by a new center here on campus that would try to drive precision medicine through pharmacogenomics. So this is our press release from when we made this um, relationship with Thermo Fisher Scientific in 2018, uh, which was really first of its kind, uh, industry academic partnership that was the only one internationally at the time to design a, a, a concept of trying to prove value across a large health system that had payer data as well as clinical data and envision testing a large number of patients in order to prove value. So I'm gonna detail sort of all the pieces of this program and what we were able to do through it and where we are in um, the, the build and the rollout for this, man, this massive project. So the Pharma Genomics Center of Excellence is a collaboration. Uh, it's housed here in Pitt Pharmacy, uh, but a strong collaboration between the Institute for Precision Medicine, as well as CTSI, as well as UPMC and different units within it. Along with Thermo Fisher Scientific, with them bringing um, some of the testing expertise, as well as the exposure and the connections internationally to be able to find the best practice um, ways of doing things. So we, our goal was to establish this academic partnership, establish leadership here locally on campus. We could funnel everything through and externally, and importantly, we committed to genotyping 150,000 patients here in Western Pennsylvania. Our hypotheses for these programs were similar to the original demonstration project to prove value but also to drive translational research and engagement, to improve medication outcomes, as I mentioned, to provide value, and then to enable genotype and phenotype validation and discovery. Because remember, it's not only the genes that are ready for prime time now, but also all the associations that are just below that, where we need to understand whether there is a reason to bring them into clinical practice or not. So the translational research around all those other associations we want to be able to cover. So we need an innovative approach to try to think about how to do broad testing, return what we wanted from the medical record, keep the data uh, available so we can add new insights or uh, change results if we needed to, and then be able to link it with identifiable data, recontact patients and do the phenotyping in order to develop this machine for implementation, implementation science and uh, translational medicine. So this is a simple model. Uh, patients come in, they're uh, tested, the DNA results are returned to the patients if they would like to have elective return of results. We will keep the medical data on file here at Pitt for research uh, and the results will return to UPMC for value-based associations along with the clinical outcomes. And again, I mentioned elective return of results to the UPMC electronic health record and to patients themselves. For the researchers involved, the data gets, the samples get banked so we can do additional analyses, maybe whole genome sequencing where it makes sense as well as use, reuse the data for any type of association in any therapeutic area where there might be some interest for investigators on campus. So a reusability model that had both clinical and research components. And then to spur recruitment in order to get to 100,000 patients, we thought about what we learned from the all of us study where patients were really excited to get these data back. We also talked to our own providers and realized that our providers were interested in getting some of this data back because it could improve the care of their patients and made sense to them. So we envision recruitment, driving value for these two groups, greater engagement, and then extended recruitment to be able to scale up to these 150,000 patients. This is what it looks like in detail. So our patients sign informed consent. This is a research study. They're biobanked in a new institutional biorepository called PIP plus me Discovery, led by CTSI. And then we have brought on new equipments to the UPMC Genome Center to be able to conduct this testing. That testing involves 1,200 genes. So everything I mentioned before um, with its clinical value, plus all the ones where there is increasing valuable, value, um, includes about 4,600 variants for pharmacogenomics, as well as copy number variants for the genes where it makes sense via a multiplexed assay that goes along with um, the array. So that data gets all stored for research as VCF, which again can be queried by investigators here on campus and within the, within the center as well, to be able to make these associations to drive value. On the clinical side, elective return results will return 14 genes to start through a CAP-CLIA workflow. And our group developed the allele translation if you type assignment uh, and reporting with the genome center to be able to get the results where they need to go in the medical record uh, and work closely with IT teams on at UPMC to get the results with decision support for clinics, for clinicians as well as through my UPMC for patients. 
So the project involves four phases. Uh, the first one's recruitment, and then developing and test of the data pipelines, then the EHR integration in both Epic and Cerner, and decision support, and finally return results to patients. So I don't have a lot of time to go through each one of them, but I want to detail the core features of each one of them because I think they're important to understand what we can achieve in this model and where it's innovative. First, recruitment. Um, the vision is two steps. We've spun up the direct enrollment. Anyone who is interested can join the study here in West Pennsylvania, join Pimples Discovery through direct enrollment sites. We have about 25 of those currently up and running, and we're mirroring some of the All of Us Pennsylvania models for direct patient recruitment and being able to get people interested in precision medicine studies. And then from that, and increasingly, we think about where there is value, where there is prescribing that aligns with those recommendations, where there's interest among certain groups who want to do research either because that's the research interest in their group or they see value for their patients. And we can imagine either uh, triggered based on appointments coming in or prescription-based triggering. You were prescribed this medication and because of that, we wanna recommend you for the study uh, as a way of getting more patients and increasing the value. We're just starting to do that now with a couple of pilot groups uh, and we expect to expand more of that as we get through COVID. Now, where we are for recruitment, um, you can see that flat line there in the middle, which everyone can probably guess is the research shutdown from COVID. But as of the end of the year, uh, we had about 8,500 patients enrolled to date. We expanded the project to recruit at 25 locations with remnant sample collection, uh, early forms of electronic consenting, be able to recruit patients over the phone uh, with electronic means. And then we've embedded in clinical workflows. So particularly with anesthesia and pre-op clinics, and we've um, mapped to other cohorts, uh, both from children all the way up to, uh, to seniors across the lifespan to be able to leverage the value of, of lifelong test results. So those will be coming here in the next couple of years. Now, also in phase one, we had to think about an IRB model. So this is our, our consents. It's innovative for several reasons. One, we can use blood or saliva. We are able to do sequencing, so we have a permission from that as well. We have a perpetual identifiable linkage with the medical record, uh, as well as payer data. We have the ability to recontact, return results to the medical record. We have a certificate of confidentiality and have allowed both commercialization and data sharing permissible. And then at the end is that question about elective return of results, where patients or participants here could uh, elect to get results themselves and have their data placed in the medical record or just provide the results for research only. And excitingly, as a first validation of our engagement and our excitement around doing testing, uh, our current data from 8,500 patients suggests that about 93% of our patients are excited to get the res results back. So to emphasizing and solidifying our um, approach around engagement, and we're excited to be able to get these results back to patients. Now, phase two is testing. So this is a shot of the UPMC Genome Center, and this is where biobanking occurs and sample extraction, where the new equipment's placed. Now, importantly, this is an entire CAP-CLIA workflow with chain of custody, meaning results can be returned for clinical use, again, under consent through this new UPMC comprehensive uh, pharmacogenomics panel that we created. And then we'll start off returning these 14 genes where we think there's immediate value. But as we get more data on more of them, because it's a CAP-CLIA workflow, we're able to re-release results from the same run, providing it meets uh, clinical validation. So this is a repository of future clinical value as more data becomes available. And because the testing is comprehensive, we're really excited about having these data available for future use as well. Now, this is uh, an analysis of that data. So to make sure that the testing was of high quality, we did do a concordance study. So this is uh, Dr. Kern Chrisamore in my lab, uh, who did a concordance valuation with whole genome sequencing data against an open array, an external facility that um, was using that platform uh, in a CAPCLIA workflow, as well as PharmacoScan. And you can see the concordance is exceptional among methods and against the other methods as reference. And the only variance that where there was uh, a need to test for the numbers across the bottom of the number of variants in each gene, we had some difficulty was in CYP2D6. And that wasn't a problem with the array that was actually known difficulties with whole genome sequencing. Whole genome sequencing can have challenges in certain um, high homology regions like in CYP2D6. So we weren't surprised to see the, the discordance between those uh, targets. But in general, for the rest of them and the array actually performed superbly for this particular use. So we're really excited about this. And this was work funded by the Pittsburgh Foundation around uh, getting this validated and set up and running. 
Now, phase two is about uh, the reporting outflow, so that's genomic data and reporting. Uh, again, we had to develop this pipeline for getting results from the Genome Center and from the array through standardized outcome flows. So discrete results of the medical record and then a report. So there's a screenshot of the report there coming out of that lab. We'll also store the variant level data for analytics, both at UPMC and Pitt in a single data store. And then with CTSI, making that data store available for researchers here on campus for cohort discovery and investigator projects. So we're midway through developing and preparing for release this cohort explorer tool, which will allow you to find patients that have certain genotypes as well as clinical factors to determine whether you wanna conduct or leverage the cohort that we're building for your own research. So we hope to have more information on opening this up a little bit later on in the spring, but we're excited to make the cohort available to investigators here on campus. Now also in phase two, we're thinking about how we will use this data. So um, linking EHR, genomic and payer data together has value. The first is on the research side of things. I mentioned these high profile returns. We can project what we think the return on value will be and then validate it for these CPIC A and B level drugs. But then the lower quality implementations, um, the ones that we aren't quite ready for clinical, we would validate and then spin them into clinical when we think there is enough data to suggest it. So this engine provides the ability to do both of those things. And then when the, on the clinical side, we'll pull the data into dashboard with UPMC analytics to be able to monitor and follow these populations and look at their outcomes, whether it be readmissions or certain targeted phenotypes uh, within specific therapeutic areas. So we've started to work with analytics around doing that and some early dashboards for our PCI implementation that we'll expand upon for this. Now we looked at the data in the first 6,000 patients, and this is Dr. Uh, Maddie Kreider in my lab as well, that's started to look at how many patients in the PIP plus discovery program are actually on medications where we would want to make recommendations. And this is an early view, but about 40% of our patients are receiving or have received medications that would have resulted in an alert within UPMC. So that's a little bit higher than 30% we saw before. Um, and then looking at the other percentages, there are some patients that are on many more than just one medication. And simply just testing these 14 genes is likely to result in data that is highly reusable across the system. So we're really excited by this and we're looking forward to building the decision support around that. So it builds on the EHR side, phase three. This is a screenshot of early tests of what it looks like with the data in the medical record in Epic and Cerner. And we have had results flow in. We're obviously doing it now out of the McGee lab. Then out of this new lab, we will uh, leverage a new installation and an upgrade for genomic that'll be deployed system-wide in April that'll allow for genomics in, within the electronic health record on the EPIC side, and then similar uh, updates uh, for the decision support within Cerner. And our team is actively building decision support for 14 genes and about 70 medications, every medication uh, that has those guidelines associated with the genes that we're testing. So these have a targeted launch date right now for the end of April. Uh, that we're working hard to hit that deadline. So decision support, this is just a demo screenshot of what it will look like in EPIC uh, for alerting. And this is a uh, phenotype-based alert based on prescribing someone trying to prescribe tramadol on a patient uh, that has a conflicting protected, uh, predicted phenotype and a uh, drug chase change. So you'll see more of this uh, coming late spring here in the UPMC system. And to get an idea of patient needs, um, if you're a UPMC clinician, you may have already received a survey. Um, so this is Dr. Katie Ryden in my uh, lab, a fellow that's been doing a survey to understand what the needs are around this. So we just sent this out to about 14,000 physicians in the UPMC system. And if you're a, a pharmacist or a nurse, your surveys are coming soon as well. So please watch your inboxes and please fill this out for us. Helps us understand what resources you need as these data become increasingly available within the health system here at UPMC. Then the final part of this, just uh, is phase four, is thinking about how we get results back to patients and how we make sure that providers are supported in caring for those patients. So that's education and return of results. So we imagine the clinician side, this being alerts, like I already mentioned, the ability to pull uh, informational data uh, in the system through websites, and then to risk stratify uh, and direct folks to inpatient and or outpatient services like the clinic where needed and for consultation to support our providers. On the participant side, we'll be using my UPMC. The data already flows into my UPMC right now, but we'll have additional resources for patient-directed education there as well. 
And then finally, on the education for clinicians, this is really important. And actually, education is one of the major uh, barriers to broader implementation of genomics. We're going to leverage a program that we call Test to Learn that provides direct clinician training. So just a couple of slides on, on Test to Learn, and then we'll finish up today. But Test to Learn is a program we developed here at the University of Pittsburgh in the School of Pharmacy uh, that teaches genomic implementation and how to make clinical, clinical decisions using genomic data. And the cool part of it is while you're learning, you're learning with real data. That could be either anonymous data if you want to use that, or if you'd like to go through testing yourself and experience like your future patients. Uh, we have that built in using 23andMe right now, as well as uh, we'll have connection to our own labs here shortly. So to date, this has been nationally deployed and licensed with invention disclosures. And you can see the grant funding here. We've trained about 3,000 learners in our School of Pharmacy, in our School of Medicine, and nursing, as well as through certificate programs and credentialed programs through University of Pittsburgh here. So we're really excited about this. And you can get credentialed and, and learning about pharmacogenomics or other areas. And that platform really is a fun way of learning online, again, working with real data. So this is a screenshot of what that looks like. This is data flowing in from the labs I mentioned. And then we bring it together with resources for videos and cases and interactive exercises for CE and CME based offerings to get everyone really comfortable with using this data in practice. So do watch for more trainings. Uh, we're grant funded with IPM to extend training beyond pharmacogenomics for whole genome sequencing applications. And then we do expect to have more offerings specifically for UPMC clinicians as the pharmacogenomics programs expand. So in closing, I want to sort of um, really share our excitement around what we're doing here in terms of being this ideal incubator for precision medicine, starting with pharmacogenomics. I covered all the different informatics um, and infrastructure-based things we built in the EHR and with using data and collecting samples and recruitments. I won't go through them again with the list on the left-hand side. And you can see our pace of genotyping here locally. Um, so this is accelerating rapidly, and we do expect uh, to hit the uh, population metrics we were trying to achieve through this new center of excellence. And we're really excited for our patients' enthusiasm as well as the provider enthusiasm for accessing and using these data in practice. So from the PPGX program has already started to connect through either collaborators or existing projects with some of the groups you see here in this hub and spoke model to accelerate pharmacogenomic testing. Um, so if some of you are on the call or in these groups may already be participating in those associations and we'd love to add more connections. So if you have a passionate therapeutic area and you can see a potential value, feel free to connect uh, with myself or through IPM and we can uh, connect you to others with, that are similarly minded or to get you access to using these data, or we can think about targeted recruitment of your patients specifically. Again, this is a um, biobanking program that essentially offloads that work from you onto gaining the value of this repository within PID and UPMC. So it contributes to a whole that will accelerate all of our uh, knowledge around genomics and we'll get some pharmacogenomic data back and have the data available for additional genomics. So with that, I'll close by thanking a very large team. Uh, this is not everybody. It, it's a team sport to, to do this. Uh, and of course, our funding. So thanks for your attention. Bill, fantastic talk. If you could stop sharing, that would be great. And everyone can see you even better. Mm -hmm. So um, if people would like to ask questions, that was a fantastic talk. I will, as ever, clap on behalf of uh, everyone that's, that's, on the, that's on the call. And if people want to ask questions, they can raise their hand by using the uh, reactions tab or they can unmute themselves and speak up. And I will just take the first question. Uh, it's pretty specific. In the precise RX program, with the 20% of patients that had actionable genotypes, do you know how many of them actually had a switch of therapy? And for the ones that didn't, do you know the reason why they didn't? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And it's also sort of a, I don't want to say a dirty little secret, but it's also something we should be asking for all implementations because people assume that number should be 100% and it should not be. There are many other reasons why just because genetics suggests something, they may be an overriding factor. Um, so our pharmacists are making recommendations based on all the clinical factors together. And across the entire, I'll use the Ignite numbers, I guess, because it's easiest and it's the largest percentage. There was between 40 and 60% of patients that could have or should have been switched were actually switched. 
And that was because of a number of reasons. Sometimes it was a provider that didn't think it was necessary. Sometimes there was a cost reason and they couldn't afford the other therapy. It was better to be on clopidogrel versus nothing. Um, sometimes there were challenges. Patients already went home and they had a hard time getting a hold of the patient when they were already discharged. So we think we need to drive those numbers up, but to say precisely, it should have been 73% of patients and we were at 55%, um, that's really hard to get. And we have to sort of use our pharmacists and use our groups to be able to, to, to capture that metric. But I think the implementation science part of that is gonna be really, really key because it's not just about here's the data, here's the alert, everybody will just listen to it. Cause as you know, um, you know, providers are often annoyed by those alerts and either, you know, go through them or there are other clinical factors as to why we had to make different decisions. And in order to get the best outcomes, we have to integrate all of those. Cool. So questions from others? If anyone wants to speak up, because I can't see everyone because there's quite a lot on the call, but if someone wants to speak up, they can. Hey, Phil, uh, great talk. Congratulations. As you know, I'm not a prescribing physician. So I was wondering actually how much is the dose reduction you can achieve? And since there was no control arm, is there historic data to suggest that if you had used that lower dose in a person without the SNP, the outcome might have been more unfavorable? You mean for um, clopidogrel specifically? Yeah, well, all the drugs. I just yeah, yeah. Drugs so, um, so it depends on the drug. Um, there are data. I'll use clopidogrel as an example. There isn't really a dose change. It's an alternative therapy. The inactivation, uh, the, the lack of activation for clopidogrel is so um, significant, and that pathway such an important contribution to the overall activation that tripling the dose or trying to get more drug in hasn't really shown to be effective to overcome that lack of activation. So we don't recommend dosage adjustment, but for many other drugs, we do. If there's a level is a little bit too high with, you know, a, um, a you know, any other medication, whether it be an antidepressant or anti-effective medication, we do recommend changes in therapy, um, usually typically based on kinetic changes. So, you know, these early studies will measure levels. Uh, Trichotillomus, for example, we can look at the levels and we can see how much of a change in variant, of a variant drives a change in level and then dose adjust. So I'd probably say if I had to guess about maybe a third of the recommendations are a change in dose, and the remaining of them are change in, in drug, but it's highly dependent on indication and drug. Thank you. Fantastic, next question. And maybe if there are no questions, Phil obviously did a fantastic job at explaining <laughs> a, a great area of uh, precision medicine. Okay, if there are no one speaking up, Hi, I have a question. Hi, Phil, this is Alan Severins. I, I'm curious how settled um, our knowledge is about existing um, polymorphisms and you know, genetic, genetic alleles. I mean, how, how fast does that um, database change, increase? I mean, a lot of research is done on uh, somewhat small populations. Uh, we have probably more genetic data for out of certain countries and certain regions of the world than others. Um, I, I'm asking sort of from a place of how future proof is a test that's obtained today. Um, you know, how likely is it that somebody would need to undergo pharmacogenomic testing 10 years from now with uh, due to updated science and, and knowledge about um, you know, different phenotypes? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, not settled. I mean, there are certainly strong associations that have come out of certain populations. Obviously, a lot of genomic data has been in European ancestry, um, as in all areas of science that we're working to improve, but we're still learning. Uh, as an example, we know a lot about warfarin, right? We know a lot about the drivers of the variability in response, and we have genes that we know are associated, variants are associated with outcome. But it was just a few years ago that we, um, or the field, uncovered a new association with another variant and a new gene that was predominant in African Americans, and that was added and things were updated. In that situation, obviously, if that gene was unimagined, it may not be on a race. Um, it would be picked up if we did something broader, like whole genome sequencing. Um, but in the majority of situations, we know what genes are involved in, especially the pharmacokinetics. So these arrays are covering 
a lot of the known variants, whether there's high quality data or not. And a lot of times the changes are moving associations up and down as we learn more about their contributions to overall outcome and less often about brand new genes. Now, it certainly happens. And in that situation, we'd have to do more testing in this particular trial. Um, but the cool thing about the array we're using is it starts off from a knowledge base, from the from GKB knowledge base of where there are all these emerging associations. So there certainly could be a like a dark horse that comes out of the a new, new association, new drug, no one ever thought of before. We have to do some new testing for, but a lot of it is um, elevating known variants to what their clinical significance may be. So reinterpretation is going to be really important, reuse of the data, but there will always be more testing. Uh, if I may, you, you'd mentioned the um, anesthesia preoperative clinic. Given that the time frame for preoperative evaluation is usually 48 hours or so as an outpatient prior to operation, how often does that information actually get um, integrated into the anesthesia management plan and does Cerner give you an interface to provide alerts uh, as part of their anesthetic record, which is a separate program from their main electronic health record? Yeah, all good questions. Uh, where we're doing our recruitment is actually in the high risk clinic. It's actually earlier than that, it's weeks before. So in a preemptive model, we would likely be able to get the results back before that clinic. But in a normal routine, normal risk patient population, we would need to have the results on file before that. Our clopidogrel return results is about 24 to 36 hours. Um, this new array will likely be one to two weeks. We don't have that from the clinical return yet, but obviously if we don't have it on file in advance, it would be less useful. We are imagining population management interfaces, whether that's separate from EHRs or within, ideally within, um, to be able to guide. Certainly with its recommendations right now, it would be within the EHR, but where there's emerging research to be done, we imagine this would be parallel and in retrospective. Fantastic. So we're just past five. So I want to thank Phil again for a great seminar. I'd like to thank all of you for, for coming and listening. And as Phil said, if any of you want to collaborate or integrate pharmacogenomics into your programs, you're welcome to contact Phil, myself, or the Institute for Precision Medicine at our website. Thanks again, Phil, and thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.